The Armed Forces Radio Service invites you to share in the vivid, colorful stories just between us. Stories as told by one of America's master yarn spinners, Knox Manning. This is Knox Manning with a few remarks, just between us, about hands, twins, express companies, and out of hibernation. Ray Shaw, sculpturing hands for years, has had many people tell him that they think their hands are ugly. Each time he hears this, he's reminded of a legend. It goes like this. There were once three beautiful maidens who carried on a competition among themselves as to which had the loveliest hands. Each agreed in her own favor. To keep their hands individually beautiful, each indulged in an unusual form of beauty treatment. One picked berries until her pale hands were a deep pink. The second gathered flowers whose fragrance clung to her fingers. And the third bathed her hands in milk to keep them soft and delicate. One day, an old lady came their way. She explained she was poor and hungry and asked for help, but was refused. As they were turning away from her, another woman passed. She listened to the woman's tale, took some food out, and gave it to her. As she accepted this meager gift, the old woman turned into an angel and said, The most beautiful hands are not those that are bathed in milk, nor the ones that bear the perfume of flowers or the tint of berries, but the ones that are engaged in honest toil and minister aid to those who need it. This is a lesson that teaches us the basic and important reason for beautiful hands. Hands that do constructive and meaningful things. Sarah Bernhardt knew this and made the most of her hands. They were distinguished neither by being long or short, wide or narrow, large or small. They were flexible, as was her mind, and they were fluid, as was the rest of her body. Her hands were at her command, and she could make them express whatever she wished. One of the fallacies about hands is that some persons are born with distinctive types of hands. This is a disillusion that musicians, artists, and surgeons have so-called artistic hands. But the violin virtuoso, Misha Elman, has short fingers and an inclined stubbiness to his hands. Though the hands of a musician must be strong, flexible, and have a delicate touch, they usually are not long and tapering. The hands of most musicians are square-palmed, strong-wristed, with fingers of medium size. Seldom are they long. Paderewski had such hands, but they are very sensitive and delicate to touch. Vladimir Horowitz has hands that are large and fingers that are fairly long. But he is the exception, not the rule. And speaking of exceptions, in ages past, when twins were born, their arrival was always looked upon as some sort of sign from the gods, either a good omen or a bad. When their birth was considered a bad sign, it was for the twins in question, because they were killed. Even today, in parts of Africa, if a woman gives birth to twins, they are destroyed, and often the woman is killed along with them. In our part of the world, however, twins, especially identical twins, are serving a very useful purpose. Not only are they helping the sales of permanent wave preparations, but they are providing scientists with much useful information in the study of heredity and environment. Not all twins look alike. There are two sorts of twins. First, there are identical twins. These are true twins. They're always the same sex, Either both are boys or both are girls. They look strikingly alike, and they differ only in minor ways. They are always exactly alike in taste reaction and in the presence or absence of hair on the second joints of their fingers. Even their fingerprints are nearly alike. Only an expert can tell the difference. Then there are fraternal twins who are not alike. These twins, alike only in age, may be of the same sex, or of different sexes. They don't look much alike and are easy to tell apart. It used to be thought that it would be very harmful to them to separate twins, especially identical twins. 
But this is not so. In fact, while many twins enjoy being together and dress alike and make the most of their similarity, there are just as many twins who might be called reluctant twins. They resent their twinship and do all they can to disguise the resemblance. Obviously, such twins do better when separated. Fraternal twins differ as much in mental ability as do any brothers and sisters, but identical twins, if brought up together and given the same schooling, will be as alike mentally as physically, even to getting the same grades in the same subject at school. There's usually a very definite mental bond between identical twins, even to the point of their being able to read each other's mind. And psychologically, they will be much alike. They tell the story of identical twin boys who were separated at birth, each being adopted by a different family. Neither child was told by his adopted parents anything about his background, and neither of them knew that he was a twin. Finally, when one of them was 21, married, and working as a telephone repairman, he found out that he was a twin. After a month or two of investigation, he hunted up his brother, whom he'd never even known existed. And not only did his brother look exactly like him, but his twin brother was working as a telephone repairman for the same company. His brother, too, was married, had gotten married just about the time he had. His brother's wife was the same sort of girl his wife was. His brother had a little boy, so did he. And his brother had a pet fox terrier named Trixie. So did he. There are cases of identical twins handing in identical examination papers, even when they took the examination in separate classrooms. There is as yet no simple explanation for such mental affinity, but it's shown up time and time again. Well, all of us at one time or another have sent something somewhere by express. Ask the average person what express is, and he'll probably tell you it's something like freight, only different, that it's uh, what you call when you have to send Aunt Jane's trunk to the station, and he'll be right. Ask the average express man what it is, and he may tell you that it's just one emergency after another, and he'll be right. From the beginning to this date, the story of the folks who take Aunt Jane's trunk to the depot has been the story of a sort of running fight. Their first fight, one that involved their existence, was with the government of the United States. And if it hadn't been for that fight, you might not be able to send a letter somewhere, maybe 3,000 miles away, for three cents. The express business is 110 years old, and it just happened. It happened because it was badly needed. In 1840, there was absolutely no sure way of sending a package anywhere. That is, unless you could afford to hire a special messenger. Parcel post hadn't been invented, and freight traveled only between large cities at a rate that was terrific. You had to pay 35 cents to send a one-page letter 400 miles, and if there were two pages in the letter, well, that made it cost you 70 cents. If you wanted to send a package somewhere, all you had left was to hunt somebody who was going the way you wanted your package to go and ask him to take it along as a favor, just assuming that he was honest. The government post riders and the stage drivers asked and got about anything in the way of a price to tote other people's bundles along. The railroad conductors did a thriving personal business that way. A couple of messengers who were employed by a bank found themselves carrying so much junk for private individuals that they just decided to start out in business for themselves. That was in March 1840, and it was the first express company's beginning. After that, other express businesses sprang up so fast and with so much success that by 1842, their competition was about to ruin the government's postal service, and Uncle Sam stepped into the picture. And it's no wonder that they ruined the government's business. The individually owned companies would carry 20 letters from Buffalo to New York for one dollar, while the government charged 25 cents for each letter carried. Well, the fight was on. The government said it was going to run the mails, and it had the expressmen arrested. Sympathetic clients immediately bailed them all out of jail, and when a case went to court, the sympathetic juries promptly turned them loose. And the end of the thing came when the government cut the postage rates and discovered that they could do a volume business at a low cost per letter. And while the expressman had no intention whatever of winning a battle for the American people, that's exactly what he did. But as you know, there always have been and always will be emergencies to be met, and the expressmen are emergency men. The West was opening up with the men making that long, painful journey across the continent. The last thing they'd hear when they left their original homes was, uh, now be sure to write... But what if they did write? There was no government mail carried outside the urban areas, no way to get the letters through. And it was the expressmen who took over. You know the story of that Pony Express. It carried letters and it carried gold. 
It even carried human beings, wives and sisters, who went out to join their relatives and went marked in care of the express. Those were the boys who fought off the Indians and the bandits and who had their own guards, their own police force. They sold speed and delivered it behind galloping horses. They carried mail at five dollars the half ounce, and the government was only too glad to let them take over the chore. Only once was mail lost. They tried out any conveyance that offered possibilities for more speed. They tried out camels in California, and they used dog teams and sleds. And when the railroads opened up, they took to them as the fastest way available. And when the airplane came along, they took to that plane just as they took to the camels because it was faster. In 1913, the government instituted parcel post service, and things looked bad for the express companies. One by one, they went out of business, and some struggled along at a loss. With the coming of World War I, the government took over all the remaining companies and merged them into the one American Express Company and made it a partner in the business. We still have emergencies. We had one when Pearl Harbor was attacked, and our west coast was actually threatened with imminent invasion. Men and weapons had to be gotten west, but quick, and the express men got the job, just as they've gotten every emergency we've had for more than a hundred years. So, when the call goes out to the express company to come and get Aunt Jane's trunk, remember that that trunk is in mighty good hands, experienced hands, and you can be perfectly sure that it's going to get where it's going, all safe and sound, just like it would in case of emergency. Those express men are all right. While we're on the subject of meeting an emergency, that is just what our armed forces do as a routine job. For instance, when hostilities ended in August 1945, the armed forces had tremendous quantities of materiel on hand. These surplus supplies were located both in the States and overseas. Much of it was new, and a considerable portion of the used items were serviceable. The disposition of the surplus property posed a terrific problem. Logistic planners had to decide what items should be disposed of and which would be retained. Some was allocated to help our allies. Other surplus had to be abandoned in overseas combat areas because there was a lack of personnel to process its return, or because the cost of shipping it back to the United States outweighed its value. Still other items were sold through the War Assets Administration and thus brought some return to the United States Treasury, and some was to be retained. The latter posed another problem, namely the storing of the items to be retained in such a way that after an indefinite period of time, they would be in condition for immediate service. That careful planning, foresight, and American ingenuity has recently paid off. The Navy's Bureau of Ships developed an efficient means of preserving the intricate and varied mechanisms of its ships at a fraction of the cost of earlier methods used. And so the mothball fleet came into being. Many of the ships in the Navy's reserve fleet were preserved through a dehumidifying process, and stores of surplus were sealed in warehouses equipped with dehumidifying systems. The value of the pickling process was proven by the speed with which many ships were returned to service after the outbreak of hostilities in Korea. The Air Force used the same principles and cocooned its aircraft, while Army Ordnance canned Army equipment. Out of cans, mothballs and cocoons, roll tanks, ships, and planes when they were needed to strengthen the forces of freedom. And as more and more containers are opened, armored cars, weasels, tanks, and planes will come out of storage to be used against the hostile forces of aggressors who threaten the peace of the world. But just between us, that's it for today. You've been listening to Knox Manning in another of his programs of storytelling. Be sure you're tuned this way in a few days when Mr. Manning will be back with stories and anecdotes just between us. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.